Hey, now it's on. Now it's on. <laughs> Hello again. Hello again. Not again, because that was the first time they heard it. Right. So we have this music stand thing here, because we used to have this really awesome, like, iPad holder, <laughs> and my guess is we stole that from the creative arts team. Oh, and they stole it back. Off the stage, like, in March, and I think they stole it back. Because they needed it back. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Guess we need our own. Good morning, Lori Smith. Um, I'm going to hop on here. Um, so, man, you guys made us work for it today. I got to <laughs> say. Um, you really made us work for the Q&A um, response today. And it was good. And that was with only one question. Yeah, that was all with only one question. <laughs> um, but yeah, you made, us, you, you made us work for it. Um, so... <clears throat> Let's see who's who's watching here. So uh, Lori in Virginia. Yep, Lori in Virginia. Um, a few others. Yep. So good morning. Can't see who. <clears throat> um, this morning we are going to talk about. Um, so one of the th so before I say that I'm going to say this. About 15 months ago, I was in a Next Steps here at Westway, and I said. Um, I said something that I should that that you should never say. You should never ever say what you're never ever going to do. Uh huh. And one of the things that I said was, I didn't think we would ever talk about the Book of Revelation. I think he said it a little more strongly, <laughs> but a little more specific too. Like we talk about. Them. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, I did say it more strongly than that. And it wasn't specifically about Revelation. I think it was about end times. Something about end times, probably some sarcastic offhand comment. I'm never preaching a series on, yeah, something like that. And <laughs> I think I am, I think I am beginning to eat my words at this point. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think, so yesterday I, I started working on the 2021 preaching calendar for Westway mm -hmm. and I posted a picture, three pictures actually, of a very bare bones 2021. <clears throat> and up in the right hand corner of one of the whiteboards we have in our in our staff room is potential topics. And at the top of that list, I put the words <laughs> apocalyptic literature. Um, and I didn't put anything else on there. I've since added a thing or two. <laughs> But I think I think in 2021 we are we're probably going to talk about apocalyptic literature, and that is not that is both is that specific. We're living through it right now with 2020. Yep. Yeah, sure. That that's because I said apocalyptic literature because that is it is generally specific enough um, <laughs> that I'm I'm not quite eating all of my words <laughs> that I said last year, but I'm eating some of them. Nice. So, so when did you like briefly, what's your experience with the book of revelation? <laughs> briefly, um, keep, keep it short. I've read it. I think when you're a kid growing up in church, there comes a point where like, I want to read that cause there's all this crazy and maybe it's a boy thing. I don't know. Um, but when I was a kid, uh, probably in junior high, uh, there was all, all this fantastic yeah. imagery, yeah. um, that was really intriguing. And so I read it first then and it's like, I don't get it because mm -hmm. it was, it's revelation. And when you're 13 years old, you probably shouldn't get revelation, um, so I read it in high school. Um, I had a, a teacher who um, who taught us some things that were not shaped by the book of Revelation, but shaped by a lot of other um, <clears throat> more interpretive takes on the book of Revelation. Okay. And I handled that probably like any well, like many immature uh, high school kids that think they know everything would do. And 
I said, that's not what it means. And we argued a, pretty extensively. And um, he was he was teaching us some weird stuff that he shouldn't have been teaching us. And, okay. And I knew I was right, but I, I did not handle that in the right way. <clears throat> um, and so it was not not a great outcome for everyone involved. Okay. Um, as a adult, as a more mature believer, I would handle that very differently. Uh, I still have the same position that I had then, basically. Um, and he may as well, I don't know. Um, but, and then in college, uh, going to Bible college, of course, um, I don't think... I ever took a revelation specific class, um, but we had several classes where we spoke about revelation, um, spoke about other apocalyptic literature. Um, we, we had basic Bible doctrine where we talked about eschatology, the end times, mm -hmm. theology. Sure. Um, that, that was a, a chunk of our uh, semester. Mm -hmm. um, Bible evidence or Bible. It was New Testament survey. Okay. Um, I was trying to put the wrong words together. Uh, New Testament survey class, obviously, Revelation was one of the books in the New Testament. And so we talked about that for a few class sessions, mm -hmm. um, probably a handful, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And really developed a much broader understanding at that point of how Revelation fits within the scope of the rest of Scripture. Okay. Uh, it's a part of the whole story. Right. So, and since that, I've taught through Revelation um, a few times with different things. If you ever like have a, a series, well, I've done a few series with the students where I just say, you guys can submit a question and I'll preach about that on Wednesday night and we'll, we'll work through that. Right. Uh, Revelation is always going to come up. Yeah. Uh, that's one of those. And so I've taught several sessions that way. Um, in my first ministry as a youth minister, I was um, asked to lead a, a small group for young adults. It was like 20s and 30s, people that were basically my age. Mm -hmm. um, and the first thing they wanted to do was go through the book of Revelation. I'm like, okay, I'm new. So mm -hmm. I'm like, whatever. Um, and so uh, that was an interesting experience with the book of Revelation because I... I think we have a lot of sensationalism that surrounds the book. And what do we need here? We're getting some help from Jim. How's that? You guys can't hear. Can you guys hear us okay? Maybe I just need to not mumble. Okay. So now we'll just stop talking and nobody can hear anything. Yeah, so wait a second. So are we good? What do you think, Dustin? <laughs> That's better. Okay, so I'm gonna turn up the mic one more time. That probably got really loud. So, got it. So how's that? So that's probably really loud. Because you're close. Okay. All right. So perfect. People, Virginia said she can hear. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for. I don't know. Was that Dusty? I think that was Dustin. Okay. So, so thanks, thanks for calling and telling us. Um. So anyway, that was. Kind of all along, it comes up from different times. And um, my tendency with the book of Revelation has been to um, try to fit it within the scope of the rest of Scripture. Because that really helps my understanding as opposed to focusing on these little pieces that by themselves, while they're that intriguing, fantastic imagery, yeah. they may not help me understand Christ anymore outside of the context of the rest of Scripture. So Good. that's been my kind of gist. Yeah, and I would say my gist is somewhat similar in the early phase. Like I remember I remember sitting in church when I was when I was a teenage well, I sat in church a lot. But when I was a teenager I remember like when I was bored, I would just open I would just open the Pew Bible and I would just read through the book of Revelation. Yeah. So lots of same lots of similar things, lots of fantastic experiences and 
and reading all of this stuff and just being, you know, just being blown away by all of those things. And then in the late 90s, I think this is late 90s, like many people, um, I got caught up in the, like, we got caught up in the whole Left Behind, like the Left Behind series came out. Yeah. Maybe that was late 90s, early 2000s. Anyway, like that Left Behind series came out. And yeah, that's where my argument in high school started. Okay. So we, like, we would, like, at that point, we were, like, when we would go on vacation, we would always go see someone in our family. Because, because when you're a young family and you have little children, that's how you spend your vacation. And it's not a vacation, that's called a trip. (laughs) But anyway, we would always spend our vacation time going to see family. So we would be in the car for like 15 or 16 hours at a time. So at that point, like we had, I think we had a cassette player. So we would get books on tape. And the books on tape, I remember there was a certain period, the books on tape we got were the, were the Left Behind series. So that's what we would listen to. And I just remember being really, um, like being caught up kind of in that story. Um, because the, I mean, the, I, th- I thought, and I would, I would argue that I continue to think, like the it was it it seemed like it was pretty well done. I feel like it was well done as far as a storytelling. It's a great story. Now, yeah, so that's a it's a great story. Um, theologically, I don't land there, but it's a great story. Like yeah. it was, it was very much like we'd get to the end of the tape and it was like put another tape in. <laughs> like that was that was what we did. Um, so so all of that kind of plays into um, our understandings of the book of Revelation. So, so all of that, so here's the question we got. Um, and this actually came last week. I alluded to it on Sunday. So this is the question. I'm just going to read it in its entirety, and then we're going to unpack it and talk about it a little bit. In 1 John, there are multiple references to Antichrist, but it doesn't seem like they are talking about the Antichrist we read about in Daniel and Revelation. Why is the word the same? And how can we tell the difference between, or how can we tell the difference since John is the author of Revelation 2? Revelation also. So there are multiple parts of this question. In 1 John, there are multiple references to John, but it doesn't seem like they're talking about the the Antichrist we talk about in Daniel and Revelation. So, um, so, so actually, there are four references, um, four, five. One, two, three, yes, There's five. four in first and one in second. Yeah. So there are, there are five total mentions of the word Antichrist in the Bible. Five. Okay. Four of them, yes, four of them are found in 1 John. One of them is found in 2 John. Yeah. So we don't see the word Antichrist in the book of Daniel, and we don't see the word Antichrist in the book in the book of Revelation. So go ahead. So the really short answer to the question, why how how was the first part of that question? Um, like the first question part was There are multiple references to Antichrist, but it doesn't seem like they are talking about the Antichrist we read about in Daniel and Revelation. Why is the word the same? Why is the word the same? The short answer is it's not. And that totally skirts the discussion. So we're done with the video. Have a nice day. Yeah. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, but the short answer is the words used in Daniel and the words used in Revelation by John are not the same as the word he used in the, lo- the letter 1 John and the letter 2 John. Right. In those two letters, he used the word Antichrist five times. That's the only place in Scripture where the word Antichrist is used. Um, It's a different word in Revelation. Right. Different word in Daniel. And I would argue that it's a different word because he's talking about something different. Yeah. Than what we tend to think of when we think of the Antichrist. Yeah. So... So like it, so one of the things we thought would be helpful would be to look at the uses of this word in 1 John and 2 John and just have a little bit of a conversation about them. Um, so in 1 John 2, John writes, Dear children, this is beginning at verse 18. 
John writes, Dear children, the last hour is here. You've already heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know the last hour has come. So interestingly, this was part of our discussion, um, in the NLT, the first usage of the word Antichrist is capitalized, and the second is not. So when we read the NLT, we tend to think that there are then, we're talking about two different people because of the way the translators chose to describe this, yeah. right? So, so there was a, there was a translation decision to capitalize Antichrist the first time in 1 John 2, 18. Like that was a decision that someone made to capitalize that. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to look back historically and see when that started to become capitalized. Right. Because when, when John wrote in Greek, that was not a decision he made. Yeah. Um, that was a decision a translator made as they translated his writing into whatever languages they were uh, translating into. It'd be interesting to see when that started to happen. But yeah. We didn't dig that deep. So. Yeah. And then 1 John 2, 22 says, And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ, anyone who denies the Father and Son is an Antichrist. Not the Antichrist, an Antichrist. So... So the picture that John is painting for us in 1 John 2 is that an antichrist is someone who denies either the deity of Jesus or denies the humanity of Jesus. Yeah. That's how John is defining this word antichrist. Which fits perfectly in the context that he's writing to, battling the ideas that Gnosticism taught about the separation between physical and spiritual. Right. And anything physical was inherently bad. You couldn't have a perfect Messiah who was physical. He had to be only spiritual. Right. And so John is saying that thinking is actually anti-Christ. And anyone who espouses that is setting themselves up against Christ himself. Right. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> I want to just very quickly say, um, before we continue looking at a few more verses here, <coughs> if I can breathe, <laughs> um, <clears throat> we are not going to go, we simply do not have all of the time that would be needed to go into this topic. So we're so we're going to do this. This is going to be thirty thousand foot view, okay? Um, so according to John in First John two, <clears throat> an antichrist is someone that denies either the deity or the humanity of Christ. So then we go to twenty two, which I read. So we read that already. So they deny the Father, they deny the Son. Those people are antichrists. So then the next usage of that word is in 1 John 4, 3. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, there it is again, um, that person is not from God. Such person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which is capitalized, which you heard is coming into the world and is indeed already here. So, so go ahead. It sort of sounds like John is saying that there is a figure... I mean, like I would interpret this is it sort of sounds like John is saying, yeah, there is a like a main antichrist, but that antichrist is also that spirit, that mindset of denying the humanity or deity of Christ is already here. Is that am I yeah. interpreting that? Yeah, and I'm not sure I'm not sure John was trying to identify like a singular Antichrist, as much as he's identifying, you know, we know that, you know, we've heard the spirit of the Antichrist coming into the world. He's already here. Mm -hmm. So for us today, we can get all caught up in trying to identify 
who is the Antichrist and trying to figure out that singular person that we have to watch out for. But I think John would argue with us that there's very little fruit to doing so. Yeah. I think John would tell us the spirit of the Antichrist has been here a long time. Yeah. Because almost 2,000 years ago, he wrote, it's hard to hear. Yeah. Um, and anyone who doesn't acknowledge about the truth about Jesus has that spirit. Right. Um, so that, yeah, that's a, a little different <clears throat> mindset than what we sometimes get into when we start talking about end time stuff. Because that, that mindset isn't very sensational. Yeah. It's, it's not that fantastic and intriguing to think, well, oh, the spirit of the Antichrist has been here for a long time. I remember, I remember in the 80s hearing that Mikhail Gorbachev was the mm. Antichrist because he had the mark of the beast because he had a, he had a birthmark on his head. And Mikhail Gorbachev was the Antichrist. Yeah. Um, I remember hearing that. Yeah. I, um, when I, I was, vaguely remember when I was, that. When I was a kid. And there have been different political figures all through time that have been identified um, in different ways with yeah. different figures. Well, but. One of the things that I have a feeling like when we get into this conversation like this um, in the minds of people watch, like we say we're going to talk about the Antichrist, and then it turns out to be like, I might be sitting at home watching this, like, and what a bummer. <laughs> like, I, like, I'm thinking, like, I'm going to get, like, I'm going to get tips to be able to identify who the Antichrist is. Yeah. And, like, you're, what you're talking about, like, it's so unsensational. Yeah. And there are... And so we've already, so believe it or not, we've already talked about four of the five times that the word Antichrist has been mentioned. So we're at 80% so far. So here's the fifth one. <laughs> and it is going to be equally unsensationalistic. It is 2 John 1, 7. I say this because many deceivers have gone out into the world. They deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an Antichrist. That sounds an awful lot like the exact same thing John has already said in 1 John. Yeah. So. Which you would expect because it's the same guy. Right. Writing the same situation. Right. Um, yeah. So we don't have five steps to identify the, yep. the Antichrist. No BuzzFeed think, articles today. <laughs> um, I think... Part of the issue that we get caught up in here is we allow our concept of really anything. In this case, our concept of the Antichrist is shaped more by outside of the outside of the Bible ideas. Yeah. Um, it sounds hard. Extra, extra scriptural concepts have shaped our idea of the Antichrist more than scripture itself has. So an example of that would be, so like we just want to be, one of the things that we just want to do is we just want to be truth tellers in all of this. Like, so for me, like we would listen, we listen to those left behind books on tape. Sure. And... I'm not like I'm not going to sit I'm not going to sit here and deny the deny the fact that like it was a compelling story and it kind of sounded probable to me. But that sounded probable because I hadn't actually read what the Bible had to say about those things. Yeah. So so when Left Behind presents the Antichrist as a Romanian named Nikolai, I don't remember what the guy's last name was. But when, but when Left Behind presents the Antichrist as some Romanian guy named Nikolai something or other, like, because I have, I, I never really understood what the Bible actually said about that, it was easy for me to get caught up in that story and then begin to think it's true. Yeah. And then I begin to project 
that onto what I read in the Bible. Yeah, there's there's an element of plausibility and when we when we start with an idea that is somewhat plausible and then read that into scripture, we can end up in places that the authors of scripture didn't really intend. And I think this is one of those cases. Yeah. Um, when we when we think about why was John writing these letters, and then in that context he mentions the spirit of an antichrist, the antichrist spirit, um, always talking about denial of Jesus as the operative piece yeah. of that antichrist spirit. Um, when we insert the the big bad guy at the end of the level character, yeah. Then those verses mean something that John probably didn't mean actually. Yeah. I don't think he was warning them to watch out for the big bad guy at the end of the level. Um, he was warning them to watch out for the doctrine that they were teaching and learning. And if someone is teaching you something that doesn't place a fully physical and fully spiritual Jesus in this world to rescue us from, from our sin, um, then do not listen to that teacher. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's hard for us to do. Like, there's something called exegesis and eisegesis. Yeah. And I kind of debated whether we should even bring up those words because it sounds nerdy, and it is. But exegesis is when we open the Bible and we <clears throat> read and we take out of it what is there. Eisegesis is when we have an idea that's already formed and we layer that over the top of what we read in scripture and then draw out meaning that fits with our preconceived idea. And it's really easy to do that. Yeah. It's actually really, really hard to go to scripture with a blank slate. And I wanna acknowledge that. Yeah. Um, we are not a blank slate. Everything that we allow into our mind actually shapes how we receive everything else that we allow into our mind. Right. Um, this is why Romans 12 is so important. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have our mind renewed by spending significant time in scripture allowing God to soak that into our lives. Are you going to tell me that I just need to read the Bible? Probably. Okay. <laughs> you already said it. I did. That's when you gained a better understanding yeah. was when you actually read the Bible. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I really like about doing these question things is it forces us to kind of, it forces us to dig. Yeah. Because believe it or not, when you ask us about the Antichrist, we don't just pull all the stuff out of our hat and... Like we have all this instant recall of information and um, I know you were digging in. You brought yeah. in, I'm going to show a little bit. Yeah. Um, John comes into my office with this book, Joe and Nine Theology, the Gospel, the Epistles and the Apocalypse. Um, pretty thick book. Mm -hmm. I started looking for my Joe and Nine Theology book. It's a different one. I couldn't find it. I actually lost a book somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that happened. Um, but I did look up a bunch of other stuff. And a few years ago, I got this packet from Shane Wood on how to understand Revelation. Uh, it came a lot out of this. These are notes from the Dunning Lectures that we had one year at NCC, um, where Bob Lowry from uh, Lincoln Christian Seminary came and taught for a few days. And he taught on how to read and apply the book of Revelation. Um, and those two guys have some great... Uh, things to say about understanding Revelation. I also dug out Shane Wood's book. Uh, he edited this. This is a collection of essays from a whole bunch of other people. It's called Dragons, John, and Every Grain of Sand. He even quotes Bob Dylan. Nice. So, Can't go wrong there. Um, we pulled out a Thompson Chain Reference Bible. You pulled out the Strong's Concordance. 
um, just to make sure. Because when you say the Bible only says Antichrist five times, that doesn't sound right, does it? Th- that's really good. And so we pulled that's out really the good. concordance, and which is a listing of every word in the Bible and how many times it's used and where it's used. And we looked them all up and there's only five. That's the ones that we read. But that's a good, like, we re- when we were, and whoever asked this question, I would say the same thing, but we were thinking it's got to be used somewhere. I was like, it was in Revelation, wasn't it? Yeah. But it wasn't. It was in First John and Second John, and that's it. Um, so I pulled out um, Chuck McCoy's Basic Bible Doctrine. You probably can't read that, but um, this was second semester's class notes uh, when I was in Bible college, and he has a chapter in there on end times and mm-hmm. a section that talked about... Um, specifically about the antichrist yeah um and i remembered no i i remembered how much i appreciated uh chuck mccoy and the little bit of snark that he could add to um explaining scripture i really enjoyed that and Mm -hmm. sometimes if i sound a little snarky that might be where it's coming from not that i'm placing blame Right. Um, we even pulled out a Greek New Testament, so yeah. you know it's good. And I appreciate doing these Q and A things because it forces us to dig in and study. But I also, I also want to make sure that people understand you don't have to be a Bible college ministry nerd like us to understand this stuff, right? It just takes time spent with God in his word to understand God in his word. Yeah. There are other resources, like mountains of them, that we can pull in that help us understand. But even aside from all of those, God has made himself known through the world around us, through the scriptures that we have, and through his people. Yeah. We gain understanding from each other as much as reading somebody else's books. Yeah. Um, and I think that's important for the church to understand. Yeah. I, I, I think it's in like a minute ago when you said, um, like we had to be reminded that the word antichrist is only used five times. Um, when we first started talking about this and we discovered that it like, that didn't sound right. And there's probably someone who, Wait, who is watching this right now, who, or who is going to watch this, who is going to hear us say that the word antichrist is only found five times and none of those are in Revelation, there is going to be someone who is going to be like, that's wrong, and I'm going to dig through the entire book of Revelation to try and find it. And there should be. And there's not. Like, (laughs) because so much of, like you said, so many things, like we have just projected our understanding and what we think things are going to be like on top of the Bible without actually reading the Bible. And this goes back to what you said on Sunday. Um, You mentioned the Bereans who were zealous about kind of checking up on what they were being taught. Does this compare favorably to what we see in Scripture? Right. One of the early marks of the church was that they were dedicated to the apostles' teaching. It says in Acts that they devoted themselves to four things. And one of those four things was the apostles' teaching. So when somebody teaches something... I'm comparing it to what the apostles are teaching. That might have been easier to do in the first century, although maybe not. Because what are the chances in the first century that you actually got to hear Peter give the sermon? Right. You probably heard second or third hand. This is what Peter said in that sermon. Right. We have Peter's own words written down in scripture that we can compare. When somebody says, hey, do you know about this? We can compare what did the apostles the people that spent three years day in and day out with Jesus, what did they actually say? Yeah. And that's what we're doing here. So here's this idea of the Antichrist. What did the apostles actually say? Right. Well, not much. Most of them didn't say anything. <laughs> yeah. John yeah. said basically that the spirit of the Antichrist is the spirit that denies Jesus yeah. and the truth about him. And that was it. And that was it. So I don't know how much we want to talk about um, 
like the question specifically mentioned, you know, here is what John is saying about Antichrist, but it doesn't seem like he's maybe talking about the same thing as the Antichrist that we read about in Daniel and Revelation. What do we read about in Daniel and Revelation? And I, and I think... Because so they don't use the word Antichrist. Right. So, so that's where I'm going to say, um, and I don't feel bad about this. Next year we're we're gonna dig tune in next year. next year we're gonna we're gonna dig into apocalyptic literature, and and what I'm gonna encourage you to do is what we talked about on Sunday. I'm I'm gonna say this in a less forceful way. I'm gonna need you to come into that conversation with an open mind. Like it's a, like and that's exactly what the Bereans did. We're going to need, like when we read God's word, we, we need to come into that situation open-mindedly. We need to come in eagerly and we need to compare what it says. Like that's, that just has to be our approach. And if, and if we're not doing it that way, like if I say, hey, next week we're going to talk about Revelation. And, and, and you come rolling into Westway on that Sunday, like with your mind made up of what Revelation says and you don't care what anybody has to say because you're just not going to listen because, you know, somebody who is way more intelligent about Revelation than me, and that's almost everyone, like I'm not going to lie about that, you know, or maybe I don't have as, like someone else is a, is a bigger named teacher or more well known. Well, they say this about Revelation, and John says that, so that person must be right because they, you know, because they've written books. Like we just we want to be careful that we're not pr- putting over the over Scripture something that it doesn't say. Yeah, and that's why I always tell people that's every week, and this is how we're going to end. When we tell you to open your Bibles and we ask you to open your Bibles, it's because we want you to. Um, like I've, I know I recommend the Bible project a lot and maybe you watching this, you, maybe, I don't know, maybe you hate the Bible project. Um, (laughs) maybe people watching this hate the Bible project. Um, back a few months ago when we were getting ready for that transition series, I watched the Ezra and Nehemiah video. And the first time I watched it, I was like, Hey, that was an okay video. And then I watched it again and I thought, you know, I'm, like they're saying some things that I'm not so sure that like I agree with the way they're saying that. So I did something crazy. <laughs> I watched the video again, only I had my Bible open. And every time they said so in Ezra 4, it says this, I would turn to Ezra 4 and I would read it. And then I was like, oh, I kind of see how they got there. And that's the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Yes. I think it's, let's just, what does it say and what does that mean? Right. Without, as much as we can, infusing what we already thought beforehand. Right. And that's, I think, what the Bereans did. And it's not that, it's not that we should be opposed. Like, like every time somebody gets up to preach, this has been a significant point of growth for me. Um, I've heard a lot of preaching. Uh, in Bible college, we had chapel every, like, Twice every week. Right. Um, I've been to Sunday school and church services like all of my life, almost every week. Um, and so I've heard a lot of sermons. And there have been some stretches where every time somebody starts to preach, I'm wondering, okay, at what point are they going to say something wrong that I can mm-hmm. argue with in my head? Um and and there there were times when I would wait and watch for them to say something that I didn't agree with. That's not what the Bereans were doing. Yeah. What the Bereans were doing was listening and comparing. Is that actually what the apostles taught? Yeah. And I think that's what we all need to do. That's what I still need to do. Yeah. I'm a lot better at that now than I used to be. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I have a much higher opinion of almost everyone that I've ever heard preach because I'm better at that yeah. than I used to be. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm just less arrogant than I used to be. I don't know. Uh, but we need to compare 
not out of a desire for conflict, but out of a yeah. desire for understanding. Yeah. So here we are again. Another <laughs> Tuesday Q&A that ends with your responsibility as Christians to read and understand the Bible in a way that is faithful and honors and honors God. Um, so we love you guys. And we, we are praying for you as you do this. Um, I'm glad you said it's not easy. So thank you. Because like every week as I work on, and, and I know like you do this on for Wednesday nights and I do it for Sunday mornings. Um, like there's nothing easy about this. It's not impossible. Um, but it's not, it's not easy. But it's worth the effort. It is. It really, it really is. So, so we, we just want you to know we are praying for you as you do this. This coming Sunday, we're going to read through 1 John chapter 5. Um, and I posted this on my Facebook page a little earlier today. Um, working through that, like, man, it's like there, there's, like there are parts of it that are kind of wrecking me right now, like internally, that I'm dealing with. Um, and that's because like God's word is speaking. And that's what happens when God speaks, is it reveals to us the truth about who he is and the truth of who we are. Um, and I, just the best thing, probably one of the best things you could do this week before you come rolling in here on Sunday is read First John chapter 5 a few times. I think there are 27 verses. That yeah, doesn't take very long. Um, just read it and, and pray through it and pray over it and come ready to um, hear what God has to say to you um, through it. So, um, so thanks for watching. We're going to hit apocalyptic literature next year. Um, so I'm just going to make that commitment. I don't know when, um, but we're going to do it next year. You heard um, it here first. You heard it here first. So, um, so thanks for watching. We love you guys. Um, and we hope to see you on Sunday, if not before. So have a great rest of your day. See you later.